tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on in my strife. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting and fighting in his great love. For I'm all I'm safe in his sheltering arm. Oh, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond the blessed heavenly shore. We're living by faith in Jesus above, trusting and fighting in His great love. From all I'm safe in his sheltering arm. Oh, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, teach your children to stop the fighting and start uniting. All let's walk and let's get together, loving forever, sanctuary for you. You were the one, Lord, who sent the Savior, heart and soul, Lord, for a land. And, and it is you, Lord, who knows our weakness. You refine us with your own hand. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Who And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you this is holy ground we're standing on holy ground for the lord is present and where he is is holy this is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. We are standing on holy ground. Angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. You are holy God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean by Jesus' blood. You are holy God. Oh, a 
perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean by Jesus' blood. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around let us pray jesus now we are standing in his presence we are standing in his presence we are standing in his presence on holy ground. You may be seated. Let us pray. Our Father and God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, with humbleness of heart, we approach your throne of power and grace, mercy, giving praise to thee and honor to thee, Father, our Lord and our God. We ask, Father, that you continue to give us strength each and every day. I pray this evening, Father, thy richest blessings upon each one that is here this evening as we head into this new week and as we walk one with another in unity of the faith. Father, we continue to pray for those that have lost loved ones, those that are struggling with illnesses, Pray, Father, for their strength, their well-being, Father, and the healing power that you, we know that you can give in accordance with your will. Father, we continue to pray for our nation and the leadership. We pray, Father, that decisions that will be made in the future, Father, in keeping with your wisdom, your power, and your word. Lord, we're so thankful for this time that we can praise your name, meditate on your word. Father, we ask that you keep us, sustain us in this day and throughout this week. Father, we pray all these things through the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Oh, safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Way down in Egypt, mid burning sand. Moses had started for Canaan's land. Never turn backward, always prevent. Unto the journey's end, hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me safe on the mountain? I soon shall stand, hilltops of glory land. Footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warning seed. Evil allurements cannot prevail. 
I'm on the upward trail. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us listen to the call of love. On the road to the goal, burdens we must bear, but we have help from realms above. We receive courage new when we kneel in prayer. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. While we tarry below, there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us see to the call of love. We are returning to a series of lessons we started several weeks ago now, looking at some bold moves, focusing in on discipleship, some moves that we need to make as a congregation. Uh, if we're truly going to be committed and sold out to this uh, disciple-making idea that God has left us in His Word. And we've been talking over the last several weeks about some of those bold moves that we need to make. Uh, we talked about how we need to, to move from church models to Christ model. We've talked about how uh, we need to move from people simply making a decision uh, to actually making disciples of Christ. Last time, we talked about moving from programs to process, and we spent a really long time. I'm not going to keep you as long as I kept you last week, so you can say amen to that. Uh, but, but we spent a lot of time talking about Jesus' process of making disciples. And if you remember, Jesus' process was to uh, allow people to explore, and then he connected them uh, to, to, to himself, and then uh, he, he helped them grow in their faith, and ultimately he released them to multiply. And at this point in this series of lessons, you might be thinking, okay, Steve, you've been preaching on this discipleship stuff for quite a while. Let's, let's just say that, that I buy into what you're selling. Let's say that I buy into what you're saying. Steve, here's the question. What's going to be different six months from now if we as a church decide to go in this direction? Ooh, uh, that, that gets to the heart of it, doesn't it? What's going to be different if we choose to go down this disciple-making path? What is going to be different six months from now? Does disciple-making really make a difference in Christ's church? And the short answer is absolutely yes, it does. Because disciple-making changes the DNA of the church. And it moves us from being about managing activities to actually investing in people. And that's the bold move that we're talking about tonight. We need to move from simple religious activity to relational investments. Because here's the deal, people matter to God. And if people matter to God, then people should matter to us. Remember that Christ died for people. And ministry in the early church was a high-touch, relationally intensive, people-driven ministry. 
That's what the early church was. They were devoted to one another. That's what they did. They were devoted to one another. They spent their time caring for each other, sharing their resources, sharing their time together. They spent their time encouraging one another. That's what we see at the end of Acts chapter 2, isn't it? In verses 42 through 47. Uh, kind of wrapping up that first sermon that Peter preached that says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, when you look at the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, it's interesting to me that he doesn't mention any activities that they should be about. But what he does mention over and over and over, what he does talk a lot about are people. He wrote to people that he loved. And as he did, he addressed their fears. He addressed their problems. In fact, Paul invested in people with his time and with his effort and with his energy. There is a church at Thessalonica. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to open with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to go there in just a second. But there was a church at Thessalonica. Uh, was a church that Paul actually planted uh, he, he planted this church on his second missionary journey. And, and what we find in Acts chapter 17 is that he entered the city. He began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues. And he was having amazing success while he did that. Many people believed the gospel, including many Jews and many devout Greeks as well. They formed the church that met in a guy named Jason's house. All of this you can find in Acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 9. But the problem was the Jews in the city became jealous and they created this big uproar. They created this riot. But I love Acts 17 verse 6 because it's there that the text says that these riot formers had a rally cry to try to get people to come to them. And what they said is the men who turned the world upside down have come here too. And they used that not to bless and praise the church but to try to stop it. Those that have changed the world have come to our place as well. Paul and Silas had to leave the city, but God was mightily at work. And that church began to grow and grow and grow. They were making disciples and they were sharing the gospel. And so Paul writes to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. I want you to hear what he says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for, our, for your sake. And you became imitators of us. And of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we have no need to say anything. And so this this tiny little house church that began in Jason's living room had started in controversy, and had grown to be one of the most influential churches in the entire region. And as you look through and as you read through 1 Thessalonians, what you notice, Paul doesn't talk at all about ministry strategy. He doesn't talk at all about new growth initiatives. It's not there. But what he does write about is his love for them. Take a look at chapter 2, verse 7. Paul says, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. What is Paul saying? He's saying we loved you like crazy. And when we came to you, we were protected of you. We didn't just come to you with the message of the gospel. We gave our whole lives to you. We gave our whole selves to you. Why did we do that? Because we loved you. 
He goes on in verse 11. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I love this. I love the way Paul writes this letter. Not only did he love them, he instructed them. It's what the text is saying to us. He taught them. He modeled the life of Jesus Christ to them. And he challenged them to live their lives for God and to live their lives in light of the kingdom. Nurture and discipline, care and challenge. That's what Paul gave them. Paul invested his life and he invested his heart heavily in these people and his love for them never diminished. Look at verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Do you hear the longing in his heart? I mean, he says, man, I just want to be with you again. I hate how things ended. I hate that we had to get away. We we, we loved you. We instructed you. we, we, We challenged you. We cared for you. We did all of these things. And then he says this in verse 19 and 20. I love this. <clears throat> For what is our hope or joy or crown or boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our great glory and joy. Paul said that when he stands before Christ one day, his hope and joy and reward for ministry is simply going to be the fact that those people are in heaven with him. Them in heaven will make all of his efforts, will make all of his struggles worth it. And and I want to ask you this question. Do you love people like that? Do you love people like Paul showed us here in this text? Are you loving people that way? You see, our job as the church is to invest our lives in people That is how Paul did it because that is what Jesus taught him to do. And we've got to do the same. Now, I got to be honest with you. When When I did all my master's work many moons ago, this is not something they taught me how to do. This is not something they instructed me on on how to go about and invest your life in people. It's just not one of the classes you're going to find in a ministry course. It's just not there. But Jesus' plan for his people is that we would invest in other people. And this is what he's saying in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, when he says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, I need you to take that and I need you to entrust it to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Here's the plan. Here's how it works. We want you to go and teach what we've taught you to people who are able to teach it to someone else. And if you will do that, he says, man, the church is going to always be growing. It's always going to be flourishing. It's always going to be moving in the direction that, would ha- that God would have it go. You see, that's not about religious activity. It's all about relational investment. But, but, but what you notice is that we have a tendency to be pretty reluctant to invest in other people relationally. We would rather be busy doing church things than we would to invest in people relationally. Why? Why do you think that is? What are, here are a few excuses. Let me, let me do this. Let me give you five excuses to why we are so reluctant to invest in people. You ready? Here's number one. I don't have time. How many times have you used that as an excuse in your life? I don't have time. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. I just don't have time. I've told you before, a very early in my ministry, someone said something profound to me that stuck with me. He said, Steve, the interruption is the ministry. But how many times have I missed that? I, I see the interruption as, oh, you got to get out of my way because i got things to do. I don't have time to deal with you. I don't have time to invest in you because I've got to do X, Y, and Z before Sunday. And if I, if I leave this to do that, then this isn't, and it's crazy. But how many times do we use this as an excuse to not invest? I just, I just don't have time. I cannot add one more thing to my plate. Listen, I know what it's like to work from sunup to sundown and still not get everything done. Believe it or not, I do work more than just Sundays. And I tell you, I have a blog. <laughs> it's called Only Works on Sunday. It's, it's fun. You should follow it if you do that. Uh, but I, I know what it's like to, to work from sunup to sundown and still not get everything done. But the reality is simply this. 
we make time for the things that are important to us. Can I get something from you on that? We make time for the things that are really important to us. And so I want to suggest to you that if relationships were Jesus' top priority, then they should be our top priority too. And most of the people you attempt to disciple, guess what? They're going to be really busy too. And if you expect them to carve out time away from their careers and their families, then you need to lead by example and do the same thing with them. Busyness isn't a reason to not follow the clear commands of God to make disciples of all nations. It's an excuse that needs to go away. In fact, can you, can you imagine standing before Jesus one day where, you, where your life and your ministry are evaluated by God? Can you imagine saying to him, listen, Jesus, I would have done what you said, but I was really, really busy. Something tells me that Jesus isn't going to be satisfied with that answer. Why do we refuse to invest in people? Excuse number one, I don't have time. Excuse number two is simply this. I've never been discipled before. I don't know what I'm doing. And and listen, I'm I'm a lot more sympathetic to this excuse because far too often this is true. Here's the reality Most of us have grown up in low investment, highly programmed churches. Most of us have grown up in low investment, highly programmed churches led by low investment, highly programmed leaders. It is the program and it is the production that gets celebrated. Life investment is often ignored. It's important, but it's not urgent. And because it's not urgent, it never gets done. But let me ask you something. Are you going to let the failures of others be your excuse for failing to do the one thing Jesus has commanded you to do? You may never have been discipled by another person, but you have the spirit of the living God inside of you. And because of that, you are more qualified uh, than you know to invest your life in someone else. And the reality is, all of us have people in our lives who have influenced us in a positive way toward Jesus. And so while you may not have been formally discipled, you can take what you have learned, you can take of what, what you have, and you can build on it from there. By the way, this is why disciple making requires great faith. Uh, The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. He's right. And so the essence of faith is trusting God to act according to his promises. So think about it in this way. If Jesus commanded you to go make disciples, and if he promised that he would be with you, then don't you think you can trust him to work through you? Don't you think that's probably a reality? And so you can let your excuses hold you back, or you can take a leap of faith and trust God to work through you to impact the lives of another person or the life of another person. Trust God. And if you feel incompetent, if you feel unsure of how to invest in another person, then find someone who has done it and let them coach you. Because most disciple makers, they want to invest in people who will be disciple makers. That's just what I've experienced in my own life excuse number three it's just not my personality steve it's not my passion i'm gonna these last three really get under my skin so i'm gonna do my best to not yell at you like i did this morning because i really don't have any voice left And, and while i recognize that some people are introverts and some people really don't like to be around people And while I recognize that others are more passionate about other things, but but let me just say, just because you don't think that disciple making fits your personality or passion doesn't excuse you from faithfully discharging the ministry God has placed in your hand. Did you hear what I said to you? Just because it's not your passion... Just because it doesn't fit your personality doesn't mean that you can say to Jesus, doesn't really fit, I'm going to go do something else. When he says, this is what I want you to be about. Is that, are, are, you following, are you buying what I'm selling to you right now? Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
2 Timothy chapter 4. This is Paul's charge to his son in the faith, Timothy. He says, to, to verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom, preach the word. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebru- <laughs> reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Say that five times real fast. With complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off in the myth. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. History would tell us that it wasn't Timothy's personality either, but yet Paul lays it on the line and says, I need you to go do this. I need you to go be passionate. I need you to go preach. I need you to go teach. I need you to go do. And the best place for reproving and rebuking is in the context of relationships, a disciple-making relationship. Number four, a fourth excuse that we make to not invest in people. Well, if I just invest in a few, then I'm going to be showing favoritism. I'm going to be just focusing in on those few people, and other people are going to be mad at me, and other people are going to accuse me of different things. Jesus invested in a few. He had 12 apostles. He had three that were the inner circle. He had one disciple whom he loved. Jesus invested in a few, and if it was okay for him, I'm going to suggest that it's okay for us. You see, there is a big difference between investing in a few and playing favorites. There's a big difference between those two. I remember when I, when I first started preaching, I had an elder come to me and say, Steve, you shouldn't have any close friends in the church for this very reason right here. And I said, that's crazy. I, I, so, so what am I supposed to do? I, I'm just supposed to uh, minimally invest in all of your lives and really not invest in anybody whatsoever? Uh, so, so you're saying that Jesus' method was, was not the right method because he had 12 and then he had these inner three, and then there's this one that Scripture seems to imply was even closer than those other three? So, so, so I'm just supposed to throw that aside because you might think I like somebody else better and, and that might make somebody uh, a little mad. But this is the games that we play at church. I remember having a Bible study in my house and elders getting mad because I didn't open it up to the whole church. I don't have room for the whole church in my house. But these are the games that we play. These these are the things that we do to try to keep people who are actually trying to do the will of God from doing the will of God because I'm not included. There's a difference between showing favoritism and focusing your attention on some people who who you think can change the world, right? Now, if I'm saying to someone, hey, why don't you come over here, and somebody says, oh, well, hey, hey, can I come? No. No, you can't come. Now, that's different, right? That's different. I'm saying you don't belong, you're not a part, I don't want you in here. Now I'm showing favoritism. But if I'm investing in my life for the sake of the kingdom, to build up the kingdom of God, people that can treat others and train others and train others and train others, then stop making up these crazy excuses that keep us from doing the will of God. These are the games we play that have to end if we're going to be a disciple-making church. Stop wearing your heart on your sleeve all the time. Because everything's not always about you, and it's not always about me. It should be about the kingdom, and it should be about growing people who can grow other people, who can teach other people, who can teach other people. Or, 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 I hope you hear the heart that that's intended with. That's not, that's not a knock. That's not, that's not me trying to smack you around. It, it, it's me just having an honest conversation with you about what the text says. Here's reason number five. I'm afraid... To show people who I really am. This is a real and very personal excuse. You see, to invest in another person means that I've got to take my own mask off. And I've got to reveal myself. i got to reveal my flaws. i got to reveal my problems and all. 
Investing in someone else means I have to live an authentic life. It means that people will see in me a true love for God, a true passion for the word, and concern for those far from God, or they're going to see the lack thereof. And I think this is why many people feel more comfortable running programs and managing ministries because they can do that and never get too close to anyone. I can keep you at an arm's length. I can keep you at a distance and still manage my ministry. And I can still make myself look pretty good to the people around me because look at the ministry I'm managing, but I really never have to invest in another soul. We can be busy but not lay our hearts bare. We can be seen as good people without feeling vulnerable, without feeling exposed. And to those of you who honestly struggle here, I want to say this. People will never open their hearts to you unless you open your heart to them. Is it risky? Yep. Could you get burned? Probably will. Should you do it anyway? You better believe it. Jesus held nothing back, and he was hurt for a time. Paul opened his heart, and he felt the sting of rejection and disappointment. But you will never know the joy and the impact that you can make by keeping people at an arm's length. You'll never know it. You'll never truly experience it, and you'll settle for something far less than God ever had intended for you. So open your heart. Give yourself freely, just as Christ has given himself freely to you. Because here's the truth. If I pour my life into buildings, even this one, they're eventually going to be torn down. They're going to fall into disrepair, and they're going to go away. If I pour my life into projects... Those projects are ultimately going to come to an end. If I pour my life into goals, those goals are either going to be reached or they're going to become obsolete. If I pour my life into fame, I will soon be forgotten. The wise man in Ecclesiastes makes this very, very clear. If I pour my life into my accomplishments, even those accomplishments will fade. If I pour my life into money, That money's going to be spent. And and Ecclesiastes says not only is that money going to be spent, whatever you leave to your children, they're going to spend and forget where how hard you had to work to get it. Just love that encouragement of Ecclesiastes. If I pour my life into my possessions, they're going to belong to somebody else at some point. If I pour my life into experiences, those they'll become distant memories. If I pour my life into organizations, those organizations will ultimately change. If I pour my life into products, those products are ultimately going to disappear. They're going to go the way of the pet rock. You just don't see those things anymore. If I pour my life into benevolence, even it is only temporary. If I pour my life into pleasure, it's temporary. It won't last If I pour my life into wisdom, it will ultimately be surpassed because there's always someone who's going to come around who's bigger and better and beyond. If I pour my life into entertainment, it will leave me empty and self-absorbed. But, but, if I pour my life into knowing Jesus and training men and women to help other men and women do the same, then what I do in this life will never fade from the earth. And it will echo, 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 into eternity. Bottom line, every person pours their life into something. So what are you pouring yours into? What are you pouring your life into? And if there was ever a time When we needed people to make disciples and raise up godly men, that time is now. That time is yesterday. The church needs you. Men and women all around you need you. And if you will follow the example of Jesus and give yourself to making disciples, your influence will live on in the men and women who come after you, and your impact will remain until the Lord returns. Because here's the truth, and I need you to get this tonight. This is me. I don't know if it's you. This is me. I do not want to give 
my one and only life into maintaining some organization. I refuse to do that. But I will give my life gladly to you and anybody else that I can to to develop a movement that will change people. I'm not here for maintenance. I'm here to, to, to give my life to a movement that can turn the world upside down again. I, I refuse to live another moment in maintenance mode. I won't do it. But I will give everything that I have for as long as the Lord leaves me here on this earth. To creating a movement that changes people. I hope you'll join me in that. I hope you'll join me in that. The lesson's yours. You can stand to your feet. We're going to sing a song. If we can pray for you, if you need to obey the gospel, you need to give your life to Jesus. Now's the time to do that. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? And to praise you, but I fall on my 